I would like to introduce John Byrne to my network and the folks who know me. John Byrne is my ideal and since I started my career almost 20 years ago, I used to listen to a podcast called Climbing the Ladder by John Byrne and it really helped answer a lot of questions I had in my mind. So John used to bring in the top CEOs and leaders from these companies and used to ask them questions about their life, about how they achieved where they were, and that always intrigued me. So fast forward, now I know John and I got a chance to meet him and uh, he was gracious and kind enough to give me time to do the inauguration of this podcast for this called the Superhuman Project. And to give an introduction, this podcast is all about individuals who want to live multiple lives. They want to explore all the strengths and skills and interests they have to, to try out multiple careers. And this always has resonated with me. Why should I just stick to technology? Why cannot I go pursue music? Why can, cannot I go pursue my own business? Why can't, can't I go pursue something which is totally unrelated? And I know John caught my attention not just for that. He used to bring in successful leaders to talk about their life, but also John himself uh, being a successful editor he switched to his own. He became an entrepreneur and he's running a successful business. So he has also, he's a multi-career uh, individual. So for, from my definition, he's a superhuman individual. And uh, so he can share with us more about what makes him superhuman. And I would like to utilize the next probably 30, 40 minutes to get into his mind how he thinks and how he looks at life and what, what is his advice for us. So I'll give it to John to for a quick introduction and what he thinks about uh, the concept of superhuman project. John? Well, let me just say that to be called a superhuman makes me blush. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel too much uh, like a superhuman, but I will say I feel very lucky that I've had um, a very terrific career. I mean, a very fulfilling and productive career. You know, I started out as a journalist, as a writer, a reporter. Uh, I became an editor. I became an author. Uh, I've written over 10 books. Uh, and then, of course, I became an entrepreneur when I launched uh, Sea Change Media, the owner of Poets and Quants, among other websites, uh, 10 years ago. And it's been incredibly gratifying to build something on your own um, and, to, and, to, and to build it and provide meaningful employment for people. Uh, we're still a small company, but we're a multi-million dollar company. And we have about 13, 14 full-time employees with 401k plans and um, health insurance and uh, holidays and vacations and and other bonuses and things um, that we provide. And I feel really good about that. And, uh, and I've been lucky to basically for 10 years, we've always been profitable. And for 10 years, we've had record revenue every single year. Um, and, you know, I don't take that for granted. Even in the pandemic, we'll record record revenue and profit. Uh, and we will have uh, obviously not laid off anybody ever. Um, so that's, I, I feel really, um, uh, great gratitude for that. Um, but what I'd also have to say, the hardest part about making the transition from being, you know, an editor and a writer and an author and becoming an entrepreneur is you have people you have to take care of and it's important. And, um, you know, every dollar you spend now is a dollar <laughs> that comes out of your own pocket, essentially. Uh, I've ha not had to worry all that much about that because we've been very successful within the first three months of our business. We were cash flow positive in the first year we were profitable, but I take nothing for granted. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of hard work involved. There's a lot of creativity involved in trying to innovate in the space. We're always rethinking what we're doing, not only editorially, but you know, through product, uh, innovation as well. We've created a lot of new and different products and also how we go to market and sell for our clients and try to bring solutions for them. Uh, 
So that's, that's been a wonderful thing. And, you know, when I started out in this business, I was a college student and I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And, you know, I was in love with music. I, um, I played the drums in a band, uh, but I learned how to read music. So I was a serious drummer and um, basically discovered, you know, uh, I probably am not, not as good as I need to be. <laughs> so I began writing about it. I actually became a, a music critic of my college newspaper. And that's nice. what actually, yeah, that's what actually got me involved in writing. So uh, for a couple of years, I wrote music reviews. I interviewed rock stars. Um, I went to concerts in New York City constantly. I uh, had a lot of fun. Um, but I, I realized that I wanted to have more impact. I wanted to write uh, stories that really meant something to people and uh, transferred out of there. And then I became editor of my college newspaper uh, for two years. Then I went to get a graduate degree in journalism. Uh, I joined the Washington Bureau of a business newspaper group. Went to London for several years to, to work from London. Came back to New York, uh, worked for Forbes magazine. Was recruited mm -hmm. Business Week as management editor. Um, became a senior writer at uh, Business Week. Then I was recruited to Fast Company magazine to be editor-in-chief. Uh, succeeding the founders of the magazine. Then I was recruited back to Business Week to be executive editor of the magazine in charge of it on a weekly basis or day-to-day -day basis for that matter, and ultimately editor-in-chief of their online operation. Uh, and then I left and became an entrepreneur. And basically I saw the opportunity while I was at Business Week my second time as executive editor of the magazine and editor-in-chief of her online operation to do something on my own and to do it in the, on the internet. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, for an old guy like me, that's a, that's a big wahoo. <laughs> uh, because I'm not as young and as, as technically savvy as you are, obviously. Uh, I'm more of a, you know, you're a digital native, I'm a digital immigrant. And, um, but it's, it's been an incredible fun ride. I can tell you, I've never been more satisfied um, in my life to build something that's all that, that, you know, that means something to a lot of people. I mean, we really help people make a very important decision in their lives, whether or not to invest in a two year full time or even one year MBA program to, to leave their careers and to make this leap of faith because the cost is very high. And I'm a total believer in higher education. Uh, and that has informed a lot of the things that I've done, frankly, and it is, informs the creation of my company and what Sea Change is all about. It's really about uh, trying to help people make the most informed decisions that they can about higher education with the underlying belief that higher education is essential to your personal growth, your personal fulfillment, your productivity while you're on the planet. Um, and it's not about the money. It's about living a more fulfilled, more multidimensional life. That's what, what higher education is about. And I am a total believer. Both my parents did not have the opportunity uh, to go to college. They both uh, were uneducated. And I was the first in my family, uh, first generation student. And when I applied, I had little to no idea about what I was getting into. I applied to one school a state college in New Jersey. Um, and I wasn't even sure I was going to go. I look back at that and I say, shame on me. I should have been much more knowledgeable about the benefits and the importance of higher education. But because, because I came from a background where that just was not ever present, um, it wasn't as evident to me as it needed to be. Now, that's in the days before the internet. That's in the days when, you know, information was not available at your fingertips. Uh, so it was a very different time. Today, you know, through, you know, technology, we have access to tremendous amounts of information to make these decisions. Uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of stuff on the internet yep. that is garbage. And our job is to get to the truth 
and to write authoritative, credible um, advice, information, analysis for people to make these decisions and to try to help shift the odds in their favor by providing information that, that, that turns into knowledge for them. So let's, this, this is really good information. Let's unpack some of this that you spoke about. From a music or an artist kind of a background pre-college, you moved into writing. Then from writing, eventually you changed locations and then you also moved, eventually you moved into starting your own business. So I would like to understand Lot, and you also mentioned this, which is very fascinating. And most of us, I can relate to this without any background in, like you said, in your family, you didn't have access to or understand understood the importance of formal education. You couldn't foresee how big an impact it can make in terms of living a more fulfilling life. You still made that leap of faith into the college, applying to a college and and getting a formal training. So help me understand. I personally, I think there are still a lot of people who are stuck in that cycle where they have a day job or they have responsibilities or priorities that they have to look after. And they also understand this information. A lot of this information is now freely available on the internet, but they do not have either time to find that or they do not have the right uh, places to go for like you mentioned there are so many uh, so much information so how should one who is looking at one on one hand doing a day job at the same time how should one or even not day job if they are just have uh, have other responsibilities how can they start thinking about knowing this they about their interests and then exploring it further to see if it makes any sense. Like you move from music to writing to now your own business. How did you uncover and how did you decide or uh, took that leap of faith? You know, I think that few people have a plan in life. Mm -hmm. um, what people do is they take one small step uh, toward often an unknown goal. And the steps that they take bring them closer uh, even when the steps are sideways. Um, so what you do is you look uh, at what's right in front of you. So look, if I uh, were having a job that I needed and I'm looking at how much it costs to go to college and it, it's, it puts me in awe because the prices are so high and I'm afraid of debt and I'd have to quit my job to go and I don't know if, I, if, if the payoff is going to be there. Yeah. To, to people, what I would say is this. Throughout college, I worked a part-time job. I worked 20 hours a week uh, on a part-time job to earn money. Uh, I think people could still do a part-time job and scrimp by. And there is a lot of scholarship money out there for people. It does take some effort to get scholarship money. Uh, public universities obviously are much less expensive than private universities. I think for a person who is concerned about their finances and their future, uh, it's less important to necessarily go to a name school. It's more important to go to a school that will be more accessible to you. What you find, even when you take a full load at college, is, is that you still have a fair amount of time. Look, when I went to college, it was a whole different thing. It was $250 a semester. Think about that. Uh, and I worked 20 hours a week uh, in, for newspapers, incidentally, writing. And, uh, and when, I was on the, when I was editor of the college paper, I worked 50, 60 hours a week on top of the 20 outside, the 50, 60 for free, which was one of the greatest fund experiences of my life. Um, and I still did well. So what I would say to people is t take the leap of faith. You get a part-time job, so you're still bringing in some money. If you have to borrow some money, borrow it, but go to a college that's affordable uh, so that you don't get yourself too heavily in debt. And if you're not sure what you wanna do with your life, and most people are not, most people don't have 
you know, a strong direction at a young age. It's, it's, you are in the majority. In other words, don't, don't feel like you're disadvantaged because you don't know what you want to do with your life. College is a place to explore. College is a place to find yourself. College is a place to gather the skills and the experiences that will make you know what you're good at and what you want to do. Now, when I went to school, uh, you know, I kind of knew that I wanted to write. Uh, and the minute I arrived there, I went, I knocked on the door of the college newspaper and signed up. But um, a lot of people don't even know, but you join a few organizations, you get to meet friends, um, you see, you know, whether you have chemistry with them and, and, and the interest that you're, uh, that gathers them. Uh, and you will, you will find yourself. And, you know, the important thing about college to me is not grades. <laughs> it's about discovering who you are and allowing yourself to learn without the pressure of thinking, oh, I want to get an A in this, so all I care about is getting the A. No, you should only care about the learning, and the grades will come naturally. And you should learn uh, to work with other people and join a few organizations. Even if you don't know for sure what you want to do, you probably have some basic interest. It could be you are in music. So if you're talented and you're something of a musician, you join the band, you join a jazz quartet. You, there's so many opportunities uh, on every single facet of life in a college community to, to belong, to be part of something. And I think through that process, you learn over the four years that you're in undergraduate school uh, what you want to do and who you are and who you want to become. And, and some people, okay, they can't even find themselves then. And that's okay yeah. too. That's okay. Uh, because there's grad school. So you try something out when you, when you get out of your undergraduate education, maybe you try a few things out and then you go to graduate school. Once you figure out that you want to specialize in a specific area, could be anything could be computer science, environmental science, could be business, get an MBA, get a specialty master's degree, could even be, God help you, accounting, <laughs> uh, whatever. But I, I think you've got to give yourself the gift of education. The most generous gift a person can give him or herself is the gift of higher education because it's the opportunity to explore, it's the opportunity to discover, it's the opportunity to build uh, the foundation from which will launch your life. You may find your life's partner there. You will find your life's purpose there. Uh, and when you come out of it, you will have a greater appreciation for the world, for its complexities. Your intellectual curiosity will be sparked. You'll be interested in, and you'll be somewhat knowledgeable about you know, what is it to live in a democracy? How many people have fought through history to create uh, an environment where people actually can go to vote and there's no violence? Uh, you'll learn the, the things that are important to allow you to live a better life. That's what it is about. So let's, let's uh, change gears here. Sure. So you go to a college, you graduate and you land up a job. And that's where the, your message about climbing the ladder comes in. Now, what about people who start a job and they land a job and they are not sure if that's where they want to climb the ladder and they have interests in other tracks, maybe other business functions or altogether a different career? How should they navigate or how should they find their way? What's your advice for them? Sure. Okay, so if you find yourself in a job that you dislike and that you think is leading nowhere and does not sync up with your interests or passions, uh, your job is to find a new job. <laughs> yes. Now, that, that is easier said than done, I understand. So there's a two-prong approach to this. The first approach is you do as well as you can in the job that you have. And your challenge is the challenge to yourself to do the best you can and to feel gratitude and, and good 
about doing the best that you can, even in a job that you're not entirely happy with. And while you're doing the best that you can, you're keeping your eye out for the opportunity that's going to be more suited to you, that's going to allow you to more naturally succeed, uh, and that you will actually enjoy. So um, that's pretty much my advice. I mean, now, sometimes you'll find that you can't get that job very easily. Uh, and people give up. Let me just tell you, that is the big, biggest single mistake people can make, to give up on their dreams, on their goals, and to settle for something that isn't quite what they really wanted. I, I, I've seen close friends do that, um, disappointingly. And I will tell you that, you know, the most important thing is just stick to it. The most important thing is resilience. Uh, and, you know, you may not be able to go to the right job in the right company or the right organization, but you can get closer and closer to it. But don't just give up and, and, tr and do something else because it's easier. So f follow up to that. What are your goals for the next few years and how are you looking for it? How, or how are you planning for it in terms of taking those baby steps that you are mentioning for people who, let's say that they want a lot of, I know a lot of folks who got affected by the pandemic, they lost their jobs, they are looking for a new job or some people who are stuck in, in that cycle and they are looking for their next best uh, opportunity. So in line with that, what are your goals and how are you taking those baby steps in to, towards those? Sure. My goal primarily is to expand our reach and touch more individuals and help them. So we are thinking about, you know, new websites, new products uh, to help do that. I have a belief that there is a super highway to a better life. Now, the super highway uh, gets you there faster, but you could take the road less traveled, uh, but it's gonna be more difficult. Now, let me, let me be explicit and explain what I mean by that. You know, for years, um, educated parents who wanted the better life for the children would ask them, uh, would you like to be a doctor? Would you like to be a lawyer? Those are the two yep. professions. And many parents steered their children into law or medicine. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that those, and there was a reason for that. It's because people who had the advantage to go to a law school or medical school and graduate uh, tended to do quite well for themselves. Well, I think that in the last quarter of a century, what we've seen is that there are uh, two more places that you can go that like law and medicine are the super highways to a good life. And those are business and computer science. Mm -hmm. well, today, to me, business, technology, medicine, and law are the four lanes in the super highway to a good life. And you get there in part through higher education, through credentials, and through hard work. And if you pursue one of these fields, the odds are in your favor of having a very comfortable life, uh, of living a life that's more full than many people can live. Now, that doesn't mean there's no room in the world for writers <laughs> or philosophers uh, or architects or archaeologists or what have you. It's just that if you choose one of those other roads to take, uh, you're not going to go 70 miles an hour. You might yeah. be going 25 miles an hour. You might be going 35 miles an hour. Now, you may ultimately end up in the same place with a good life. And I'll let people define that because it's not about the money again. It's about having a partner you love. It's about being surrounded by friends and family that, that support you and encourage you. Uh, it's about living a comfortable life where you can enjoy you know, life's good things, whether it's going to a movie or a play or a concert uh, or reading good books and having a library in your house and owning your own home uh, and, and having great hobbies that may, 
you be elusive to people because of expenses, whether it's skiing or, or driving a boat or, or whatever. Um, but the super highway is going to get you there. Law, medicine, business, technology, computer science. Okay. You take the other roads uh, and they might get you there. Uh, it's going to take longer. It might be harder. There's probably more competition. And uh, at the end of the day, when you finally get there, uh, some of the rewards may be more elusive uh, than they would be to someone who took the super highway to get them. Now, I lay that foundation because when I think about my company, what I want to do, um, I'm trying to build the super highway to a good life. So we have a law school site called Tipping the Scales. We have several business school sites. The, the biggest, of course, is Poets and Quants. But I would like to do a site uh, for people who want to pursue a computer science and engineering degree. And I would like to build a site for people who want to go to med school. Because I want to basically um, be you know, the person on the side of the highway cheering you on, helping you drive in the right direction, giving you the map, the directions, uh, so that you don't have to take a detour, uh, and so that the drive is as pleasurable as it can be, and it's unlikely to result uh, in a waste of time, waste of effort, waste of, waste of your joy and your bliss in life. So ultimately, that is the goal for the company, to launch sites in computer science and engineering and uh, medicine and to do what we do in the business field for those fields as well. Uh, above and beyond that, you know, I have a goal to employ more people, to provide meaningful employment to people. Um, I think one of the greatest things an entrepreneur does, more than creating any product or service where there's demand, is giving people a chance to, to fulfill their own dreams and to feel good about what they do uh, and to feel like they're making a contribution to others. So to the extent that I expand and grow the company, I feel that that's what I'm doing as well. And, and honestly, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I never, I was never anti-business, I was always, always pro-business, is because I think the greatest benefit business provides is giving people a chance uh, to fulfill their dreams and to um, have personal growth. Now, I know many people are disappointed because you know there is a profit motive in business. There is all there are all kinds of companies, good and bad, just like in everything in life, uh, and it's very easy to become disenchanted. But ultimately, I think that pursuing business is an honorable career uh, and a good one, and uh, that's. That's at the heart, of course, of what we're all about at Poets and Quants. So, so my, my next steps are, are to build out these two other areas, to hire more people to do that, uh, and then to innovate and, like crazy. Um, that's a really important thing because, you know, there is competition in what we do. Um, and the way to stay ahead of it is to continually uh, create new things uh, and to think about things differently. Even, even in, you know, editorial, I think one of the key things that we do is we, we do a lot of stories that you would never expect. Um, and those, those stories I think surprise and delight a lot of people. And more importantly, they inform them in ways to help them make better decisions for themselves when it comes to higher education. And that's really the bottom line. So it's kind of more, more of the same, except more of a growth mode um, and hiring good people and, you know, helping nurture them is, is really key. So I, I, I love the, the way you explained, you know, you laid out that visual in my mind about s slow moving roads versus super highways. I loved it. And I'm just taking this concept further in terms of the world of multi-careers and multi-disciplines, how should one think about like you are in a corporate job and you are climbing up the ladder versus jumping the ladder from one ladder to another ladder? 
what comes to your mind? Well, uh, there's no doubt that when you jump from one ladder to the next, you will get more money and more responsibility quicker. That's proven mm -hmm. by research. So, you know, sometimes what happens is the person who's most important to anyone's fulfillment at work is their immediate boss. Yeah. And if they lack chemistry or they lack trust in a boss, they need to get out right away. Very important. Um, because your daily life, your daily happiness and the happiness of your family is dependent on that relationship. And if it's a good relationship where someone is mentoring you and giving you increased responsibility and rewarding you uh, for your hard work, that's a wonderful thing. And you should kind of stay there. Um, but if not, you need to jump the ladder and go someplace else. It could be another company. Or in the case of many MBAs, as you know, you know, most people who pursue an MBA do so to pivot in their career. Yeah. It's a so-called triple jump, which is you change industries, you change discipline, and you change geography all at once. And many, many, many MBAs do that. And almost all MBAs do at least one jump. Uh, more often than not, it's, you know, it's going from one industry to another. Uh, a lot of times it's going from finance to marketing or strategy um, or vice versa. Uh, and many people obviously use the degree to uh, change their location, in particular international students who might come to Europe or the United States for an MBA and, and seek to work in the country in which they, their school was located. Um, and I know that there is still a lot of concern about that for people who come to the United States because we've had, unfortunately, uh, leadership in this country that has been bankrupt, that is leadership that, uh, that has espoused anti-immigration rhetoric, that has made a lot of people feel unwelcome in this country. That administration is going away and is gone. It was an aberration a total aberration. And I believe strongly that the United States will return to a place where we understand and welcome uh, smart, hardworking people from all over the world to come and contribute to our economy and our democracy. Because the only secret sauce there is about America's success, the only success, is that for decade after decade after decade, we've been able to attract the world's best and brightest because we have a more open economic system and we have a democracy. And um, that is the only reason why America has been successful, period. No other reason. Yep, yep. And you close off that spigot and America will become like any other slow growing European, Western European country, okay? That's just the truth. Uh, and I don't you know. I love the United Kingdom. I lived there for, <laughs> for three years. I have great f friends and I have a terrific affinity for the people and the country. Um, I feel we're like blood brothers. Okay. But I will tell you, uh, I don't want the United States to become an another United Kingdom. In terms of innovation, you mentioned you keep track of innovating. So I would like to understand in in the journey for jumping the ladder or moving uh, changing disciplines that requires a lot of learning that requires a lot of innovation and making sure that you are looking around keeping track of things and trends what is your method of innovation or how do you keep track of what's growing how do, how do you do that what's your advice there so obviously i read a lot and uh, not only do I read a lot, but I also like to read what people are saying about things. So there, there are forums that I uh, routinely go to to see what's on the minds of, you know, the demographic that we're looking at. Uh, what are they thinking? What are they saying? Uh, what challenges are they encountering? So listening and reading are two very important aspects of this. But, you know, today, um, let me just say for many people who are in the regular working world, there is 
a tremendous a number of opportunities out there for you to explore uh, and become more knowledgeable. So, you know, uh, there are online courses, massive online courses, right? MOOCs. Uh, they've kind of jumped the shark to some extent because people's expectations for them were much higher than uh, than could be realized. But nonetheless, there are a lot of courses out there that you can take for free uh, to see if you're interested in a given topic or subject, uh, to, to meet other people who would be interested in that same topic through discussion boards uh, or other online forums. Uh, there's a wealth of opportunities out there today that didn't exist years ago to do exactly what we're talking about. You're working in a job, you're kind of slugging away, it's a bit of a grind, you feel like you're not going anywhere and you need to. Your ambition and your life's goals uh, were not about what you're doing. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe you have family, maybe you have debt, uh, maybe you're risk adverse and you don't want to take a chance and jump to either uh, quit your job and go for a graduate degree or, or quit your job and try a new, new company. Well, you can do a lot of exploring on your own. You could go out and see, okay, what are the free courses that I can take at Wharton or the University of Virginia or Oxford or Cambridge? Uh, and the course could be in philosophy. It could be in political science. It could be in literature. It can be in a business topic, whether it be strategy, finance, accounting, marketing, operations, supply chain. Um, you can take that baby step, okay? Well, let's go back to the steps. It's a very small step with no expense to go and take a free course online. And it's not the same thing face-to-face. Uh, or it's not even the same thing as online education where even an online MBA degree, for example, they're in a good program. There are weekly internet live classes. Uh, all the material has been organized in a way to uh, advance learning. There are often are in-resident sessions. There are global immersions. There is one-on-one coaching. Um, but you don't have to take that step. You can take the smaller step and just take a few MOOCs here and there on different topics. Uh, why? Even if you don't necessarily say, hey, that's my interest, but it's to broaden your mind, uh, think more deeply about what you ultimately want to do. And it could be a course in English literature <laughs> uh, might get you there. Uh, or Freudian psychology. Um, or a course on the great architects. Um, or courses on history and what one learns from the past that could spark the the light bulb in your head uh to make you think a little bit differently and think of it as fun think of it as entertainment uh think of it as an, an again an investment in yourself and and these smaller steps can lead you to uh bigger strides and and your ultimate direction so there are things that you can do like that. Also joining organizations and forums uh, and meeting other people outside, you know, the people you would normally collide with uh, in your professional or personal life. These are all yeah. things that expand your mind, expand your horizon, uh, and make things that right now seem so far away and elusive possible. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that really actually has worked for me in the sense for people uh, who are looking at switching careers or moving to a different discipline, what I typically do is I have a list of folks who are top of in their field. I would go out, listen to their interviews on YouTube and also listen to probably try to pick up nuggets of things or trends that they are following and try to go there and listen to that and make an assessment if that is something really that I'm interested in or not. So. Right. So that that really has helped. So you just mentioned these MOOCs and keeping track, reading a lot and listening. What's your philosophy of time management? What is that one thing or one tip you would give out to people who have so many rocks in their jar or so many pri multiple priorities they are chasing? What is that one time management trick that 
is works for you and you would advise your younger self if there is one thing that you know that always works for you that you have learned the hard way the first thing you do in the morning <laughs> is to tackle the thing you don't want to do you know in yeah. the on everyone's list there are one maybe two maybe three things uh that you really hate to do uh it could be you feel like in your time it could be something that's difficult to do it's uncomfortable to do the first thing you do every day is that get it out of the way because the rest of your day will be a lot easier if you get the most difficult thing out of your way first thing that's good that's good and then what's your advice for networking i know a lot of people are not comfortable talking to even if they are within a structure they have a job they have they are not comfortable talking to strangers or not comfortable to talk, uh, reaching out to senior leaders and and they all they are always thinking of how that senior leader thinks or how to get their attention what's your advice to them well there normally needs to be some sort of connection this is what's wonderful about mba education you know when you're a student a graduate student in a business school um people are just more open and more accessible to you than they otherwise would be they just are they want to help you uh they want to go out of their way to help and you'll find that in general to be honest i think maybe it's me because i i mean i'm approached every day by people i try to help one where i don't even know who they are they might ask for advice i'll give them advice i'll talk to them on the phone i'll email them i'll zoom with them whatever i'll meet with them in person um i just believe you know in giving back and helping others uh, as much as you can so i would say to those people who are a little reluctant to do this use what network you already have in other words if you you have an uh, you graduated from a school uh you use the alumni as a way to uh, reach out to people um if you were uh if you're a candidate for a job at a company you can uh go to linkedin and see who else works at that company and who may have something in common with you it could be an undergraduate institution it could even be a geography maybe both of you uh, grew up in the same area um uh, mm -hmm. you know but there needs to be some connection to to in you know most likely increase the odds of success and then you know you got to be clever about this you don't you know call someone up and say hey can you give me a job or can you help me get a job <laughs> yes yeah pull up and say hey uh here's where i am in my life i'm thinking about this and i'm thinking about that um and you know you are in a place frankly that i greatly admire and respect and i would love to have your opinion about this and you have a more open conversation uh versus a specific one uh where the person you're contacting doesn't feel pressured to to try to or or feel like the need to to explicitly help you in a way that becomes more difficult in other words just talk to people um i know some people have difficulty doing that and networking for many people is an awkward thing go and take a mooc on networking okay <laughs> there i like it yeah when you you know one of the things you you learn in business school is how to network and and how to do it smartly and you literally practice it and like interviewing uh the more you do it the better you get at it the more natural it becomes uh so that it it's not forced it's not scripted it doesn't feel rehearsed it feels very natural like having a conversation with someone over a drink in a bar that's what you want no that's very helpful i i love the some of the learnings you shared with us in terms of i love the concept of super highway versus versus non super highways for managing your career for living a life of meaning uh I love what you shared about networking and reaching out to people. And so with this what comes to your mind when I reached out to you about this idea of starting this community of superhuman individuals uh the superhuman project. What came to your mind? How what was your reaction? Well, I have a positive reaction because to me it's about reaching one's full potential. That's what it really is, okay? 
And, and over the years, there have been, you know, full potential movements of one kind or another. Uh, and there's been a lot of um, movements that have, that have encouraged introspection in one's life to allow one to live a fuller and more complete life. And so when you use the term superhuman, I think to me, what it connotes is living one's life to the fullest, realizing all the potential that you have uh, to make a contribution in the world and, and to live a life that you can be proud of. You know, ultimately it's about staring at yourself in the mirror and the person who's looking back at you, are you proud of that person? Are, are the, did you handle your disappointments in life well? Everyone has regrets. Everyone makes mistakes. But on the whole, are you happy where you are? And to me, to be superhuman is to look in that mirror and say, hey, you know, I kind of like that guy. <laughs> I, I, think I like that, that definition. That guy, that guy has lived, you know, he's lived a life that, that, that's worth living. That, uh, and, and you define that the way you do. Don't let other people define it for you. Okay? If, you're, if, if your goal in life, incidentally, is not to have a career, but it's to have a family that loves you, that cherishes you, that you're deeply invested in, then make that your life goal and pour all of yourself into it. Uh, and when you look in the mirror, you will be a very happy person, just as, just as the person who pursued a career and tried to get work-life balance in some semblance of order um, and, you know, became an executive someplace and makes, you know, a lot of money and has a second house and all this. Maybe, you know, you look in the mirror and you'll be happy too, <laughs> you know, but you define what success looks like for you. Uh, just make sure, you know, you uh, fulfill the potential that God has given us um, and make the best of it. That's, that's really good. And so what's, uh, what's one book that you always go back to that probably guides most of the things you do in life, business, people? What's that one book that you always recommend or try to gift out to people? Oh, boy, that's a hard one. But I will say, you know, uh, John Gardner, who uh, was at Stanford for many years, um, and what was a formidable figure and a great writer. And uh, he has several books that are just filled with inspirational, motivational gems. And these are not the trite things that you'll find in self-help books. Mm -hmm. These are the things that are far more meaningful about thinking about your life and how you've lived it. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you uh, that I can't give you the name of the one book that's well-thumbed, that has corners turned down and page after page highlighted. And what I often turn to, because for some reason I'm having a mind melt and I can't remember the name of it, but it's a slim volume. It's by John Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E he had taught at mm -hmm. Stanford for many years. He, he was a giant. Okay? He was also involved in the government in Washington. He taught at uh, Stanford Business School, uh, and, but he was not a business person per se. Um, and it's, it's, if I can remember it, I'm going to, I will remember it. It's on my shelf. Uh, I can't get up where I am right now and grab it off the shelf, but I will let you know because sure. it is worth having on your shelf or at your bedside table uh, just to take a read of it. It's a book I've read maybe a half dozen times at least, but it's a book that I often take down from the shelf and refer to. Uh, oh, sorry. Here it is. Uh, Self-Renewal. Okay. John Gardner, Self-Renewal. Self -renewal. And, and it really is about just, you know, how, how do you renew yourself? There, we, we fall into ruts. It's natural. It's part of life. Life can be a roller coaster for most people. Um, this is a book that, that makes you sit back uh, and think about the things you've done, the things you want to do, um, and inspire you to get there. This is no quick fix. 
no five secret things to do <laughs> to lead a happy life. This is a really thoughtful, intellectual book um, that's very accessible, oddly. Uh, and really, you, 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 you read passages and you can't help but underline them or just have them float in your mind for days on end because the book is that well written, that well thought out. John That's Gardner, great. Alfred Newell. I'll I'll add it to the top of my reading list and I'll I'll read it and definitely definitely share I what I learned what from it. Think of it. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So before I let you go, for all the folks who are watching you on this video or listening to you on the podcast, if they have more questions for you or if they want to reach out to you, how, where should they find you? Sure. I'm at john at poetsandquants.com. J-O-H-N at poetsandquants.com. It's A-N-D, not the ampersand. Perfect. Perfect. Again, thank you so much, John, for supporting me with this initiative. And I cannot tell you, I'm so excited. I took a lot of notes, as you can see here. <laughs> wow. I, my, my, and uh, definitely, I would... I would share this with the listeners, but I really appreciate you giving us time. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure and uh, good luck to you on the whole superhuman series and the project you're embarking on. Um, I think your goal to inspire others to fulfill their own potential is one great goal. Thank you, John. Good luck.